and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This week in worship, Pastor David looks at a really tough question of how Christians can get along in a polarizing world. Let's listen. This is a series of questions where the congregation submitted questions, and then Pastor Dana and I do the best we can to explore them, not according to what we think, but by diving into Scripture to say, okay, what does God's Word have to say about these questions? And I have to admit, I think the two questions that we're going to cover today are two of the most challenging questions for the whole summer series. So you came on the right Sunday. This will be fun to explore with you together. Here's the first question. I'm just going to jump right in. Why is it that a religion, ultimately based on God incarnate and helping and blessing the marginalized, wind up mostly becoming a religion that justifies marginalizing people. Racial ethnic minorities, LGBTQ plus people, the poor, the disabled, etc. Ouch. Does that question make you uncomfortable? Because that question makes me uncomfortable. As a pastor of a Christian church, I don't want anybody to ever see Christianity as something that marginalizes a person or a group of people. And so I think we need to begin just with with that, that statement that if Christians are ever marginalizing anybody, then they are no longer following the teachings of Christ. We follow Christ, and Christ never leads us towards marginalization or oppression in any way. Here's what we really need to remember. If this is a question that you struggle with, we need to remember that we follow God, we do not follow other Christians. And that's good, because other Christians at times can behave very poorly, can't they? And that shouldn't surprise us, because Christians are sinners in need of grace, just like me. And the hope is that Christians are trying to live towards a higher ideal that God calls us to, but that doesn't mean they always hit it. And if you look at the history of the Christian church, they've done so much good in creating hospitals and creating universities and spreading God's love to the world, but there's also been periods where you probably look at the church and go, huh, that doesn't seem to mesh with my understanding of Christianity or my understanding of Jesus' teachings. And so if that ever happens to you, and and you're seeing this out in the world, don't let it dissuade you from following the goodness of God. Because God is too good to let anything, any obstacle stand between you and the presence of God. Now we're going to dive into this question a little bit more later when we open up the scriptures, But first, let me introduce our our second question as well, and it is no easier than the first. In today's political world, I'm ashamed of the Christian religion. If God is leading Christians, and most Christians are so far from the teachings of Jesus, how do I continue to believe in God? Double ouch. Whew. I mean, let me begin by stating the obvious. We live in a very intense political climate, don't we? I mean, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of us lost a friendship over the 2020 election? How many of us struggle to relate to others because you really voted for that person? Our politics have come to define us and divide us. This whole country is as divided as I can ever remember it. A a survey that came out recently said that the percentage of Americans that strongly dislike people from the other political party has gone up 400%. And I bet that does not surprise you. As you look around at this world we live in, honestly, it reminds me of something that Apostle Paul said 2,000 years ago when he too was dealing with some of this. And he said, if you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. These are true words. And we don't want this for our country, do we? We want to be a cohesive, 
united states of America. And unfortunately, what I see is is a lot of division in this world. And instead of the church standing up and, and leading us to a place of grace and truth, the church is too often just following in the same patterns of division that are so popular around us in the world. But this should not be so. Because as a church and as Christians, we hold the most important message that this world will ever hear. We have the gospel message of God's saving love for this world, and nothing should get in the way of the world hearing that message that we want to share. Here's one thing as we begin this discussion that I need to make clear. Difference is inevitable, but division is a choice. You will have differences with people around you. Uh, In the first service, we had the Vacation Bible School students. They they came up and, and they led the songs from this past week, and it got me thinking, we teach at that age that differences are okay. We teach in these elementary school ages that, yes, you're not going to be like everyone around you or in your class, and that's okay. And I feel that we have forgotten that as we age. And we go, ooh, you're different from me. You think differently. You believe differently. Maybe you vote differently than me. And because of that, we divide ourselves. Differences are natural. It's where the division comes in, where that becomes a choice a choice that we make to divide from other people. So knowing this and understanding the the culture of our world that we all live in right now, it makes me wonder, what role does the church have? And not just unity, but the church universal. What role does the church have in moving this world to a place of unity? What role does the church have in moving us away from this divided world into a place of healing and peace. We live in a fractured society, and I think the world needs the church to help model what is possible and to move us forward towards God's ideal. And to that end, we can draw on the guidance of Scripture. And we're going to look at a passage from Ephesians today. This is Ephesians chapter 4. And Paul is writing to a church in Ephesus, and they were dealing with these issues as well. They were not so unlike us today. And Paul looked at their issues and and looked at their division and really said, okay, the church has to be separate from this. The church has to model something different than what they were seeing in their world. And he goes on to say what the church should be in a society of division. The words that were so true 2,000 years ago for the church in Ephesus, they are so true for us today as well. And so won't you imagine Paul speaking these words to you? We begin in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, and he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, because he is writing this from a prison cell, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We have been called to live lives for God. And this is the highest calling that you will ever receive in your life. That means that every decision you make, every choice that you decide, should be through the lens of your highest calling of following God. That comes first and foremost. And Paul begins by saying, remember. Remember this high calling that exists in you. And it makes me wonder, as we're thinking about this call by God, is there some sort of way that we can live or behave? Is there some sort of characteristic that we could display that if anyone looked at us, they would recognize that calling? I mean, is there a sort of way of life that if you lived in that way of life, then others outside the church would be able to look at you and say, huh, I think something is different, and I want to know more. These qualities, that's what Paul's going to say next. The qualities that show that we're living up into this high ideal of Christ's calling. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient 
bearing with one another in love. So, as Christians, we seek to live lives of humility. We seek to live lives of gentleness. We seek to live lives of patience. We show that we are taking the Christian faith seriously when those outside the church can see these characteristics in us. And I think that last one might be the hardest, bearing with one another in love. Now, notice Paul did not say put up with one another. We're not called to put up with one another in love. No, that word bear implies bearing one another's burdens. We are to bear with one another in love. That means that I'm helping you carry your burdens when you need it most in the same way you're helping me carry my burdens when I need it most. The church, the church is such a beautiful and and unique place because it is designed to be a place where you can come and you can expect that those who worship with you will seek to bear your burdens when you need it most. Maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you came to church today and thought, okay, I'm just going to sit in my pew. I'm going to listen to an amazing choir. I'm going to try to learn something from Scripture, and then I'm going to go home. But when you come to church, you're a part of something. You're a part of a community of faith. And Paul says this community must bear one another's burdens. In love, we must come and join together when others most need it. That that means that you don't need to journey through the ups and downs of life alone. No, the community of faith always journeys with you. And this vision of what the church can be, Paul continues to, to really delve into that. Here's what he says next. And make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I read that and reflected on that this last week and realized unity does not come naturally. Uh, What comes naturally is division, as we talked about earlier, but but unity is really hard. Uh, Unless you're talking about unity with people like you, that think like you, that enjoy the same things as you, then it comes a little easier. But unity with people who are different than you, that can be quite the challenge. And I often thought, in our world, unity is not really valued, is it? It's not a quality that people put in front of you going, ah, yes, if you display unity, that's, that's an amazing characteristic. I think what's valued in our world is winning, right? You want your side to win. It feels good to win. Whether you're winning a ball game, winning an election, or just winning an argument, it feels good. But Paul's not pushing us to winning. Paul says if you become a a part of a community of faith, your goal is not to win. Your goal is to unite with one another. Unity. Make every effort, Paul says. I read that and went, okay, there's no half measures here. Paul's not saying, well, just try the best you can, and, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Make every effort you can towards unity of the Spirit through the bonds of peace. Why do you think this is so important to Paul? As he looks at the early church, and I would guess as he sees the church today, why is unity, the quality that he puts out to say this, this is what I need from you? Well, I think it goes back to us as a church having that essential message, the message of the gospel that this world needs to hear. And if this world looks at the church and they don't see that message— If they see instead division or arguments or anything that gets in the way of that message, I think that would grieve Paul. And Paul would say, we're not doing our job. We need to come together with people who maybe don't even think like us to put that most important message first. This is so important to Paul that he goes on to to really talk about what that looks like in the church. And so I, I want you to pay attention to how many times Paul uses the word one to emphasize unity within the church. Paul says this, he says, there is one body, meaning the body of Christ, and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. Seven times. Seven times Paul uses this word one to emphasize the unity that the body of Christ has with one another. We have one hope, Paul says, and we place our hope in Jesus Christ. That is a shared hope of everybody who walked through those doors today. We have one Lord. There may be a million different denominations, but there is one Lord and one faith that guides all of us forward. What Paul is trying to get us to understand is that church members will always have more in common than they ever do have differences because of the central unity in Christ that God has formed of us. So, I would encourage you to maybe go home today and and read the rest of Ephesians chapter 4 and read it as a, a spiritual practice for you this week. It is full of good, enriching words, and we can't get to it all today. But what I want to do is I want to jump to the end. Because what Paul has done so far is he's laid the foundation for you. And he said, if you come to a church, if you want to become a part of the body of Christ, this is what's important, right? Unity in faith. And then he builds off of that to say, I know it's not easy. I know things will get in the way, but then here are some practical ways that you can seek unity in your life. And and so we're going to end our time together studying some of the practical ways to seek unity. And I want you to, as we go through these words, both think of your relationships in the church, because that's what Paul is primarily speaking about, but also think of other relationships in your life that are in need of unity. Uh, Maybe there's been a relationship that you've just struggled with. Maybe you don't see eye to eye. Uh, Maybe these last elections really were straining on your relationship. Think of some relationship and bring that to the forefront of your mind and then apply these teachings of Paul and unity to those sorts of relationships. Here's what Paul says first. He says, so then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. I really like that. That's not easy advice, but I think that's good advice. Uh, Because as Christians, what Paul is saying is we don't always have to see eye to eye with one another. But what we do have to have is a mutual value of the truth. Uh, that means if, if you're in a disagreement with someone, the hope is that you can say, okay, we understand that we don't see eye to eye, but together we're going to try to seek the truth. Uh, we have a mutual value of seeking what is true and putting away all falsehood. And so can we do that together? Can we try to seek what is true together? What that does is that makes you more partners and less adversaries in whatever issue it is that's getting into your relationship. And I think Paul says this because he says we're members of one another. That's really important. Uh, What he means is you don't come to church and then you are just your individual self disconnected from everybody else. You are members of one another, even if you don't know everybody's name, even if you wouldn't recognize everyone else's face when they went to Publix after church, even if you didn't ever go to the first service and didn't know all those people, it doesn't matter. If you are a part of the body of Christ, you are members of one another because we have shared values and shared hopes. Really what Paul is saying is we have a shared mission. We're all on this joint mission together to go and share the love of God with the world. So keep that person or relationship in your mind that you're struggling with, and the first step is saying, how do we seek truth together? And then Paul gets a little more, I would say, challenging. There may have been a time where you've gotten angry in that conversation, and that will happen from time to time, won't it? Because if you strongly believe in something, if you've got your own convictions, and those brunt up to someone else with strong beliefs and convictions, passions can rise, and anger can rise, right? What Paul is going to say 
is not suppress your feelings so that everyone can get along. We sometimes think that would be the nice Christian thing to do, right? Oh, just, just suppress what you're feeling so that, that you can keep the peace. That's not what Paul's going to say. Instead, here's what Paul says. Be angry, but do not sin. Isn't that interesting? Let me read that one more time. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not make room for the devil. So, that person that you are angry with right now, be angry, but only if it is productive anger. Productive anger is anger that that wakes you up and says something is wrong, either in this situation or out in the world. And then, productive anger really encourages you to go and do something about it. It's not just sitting there in your house feeling, oh, I'm so upset with this person. But it's saying, I'm going to take those feelings and allow it to motivate me to go and make a difference in the world. So Paul would say, be angry if your anger leads you to creating a more just, grace-filled, and loving world. If your anger leads you there, please be angry. But anger leads us to sin when we start marginalizing people, just like in that first question. Anger leads to sin when we start painting whole groups of people with the same broad brush or degrading other people. That's when Paul would say, no, 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 that's not the anger we're talking about. And and notice, too, that Paul doesn't want us to be angry all the time. He doesn't want you to walk around just like a grump, just, just angry all the time. There's a limit to your anger. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, which means you have about 12 good hours to be angry. And after that, you just have to let it go. You are not supposed to keep anger in your heart for days after days after days. That's not healthy for you, and it's not healthy for the relationships that you are in. This might be a good time for a a call to action. If you have been a part of a conversation during this heightened political time that we live in where anger got the better of you. Or if there's been any conversation that you've been in that you've come to regret your part in, there is still time to go and reconcile. Because as Christians, again, we don't seek to win. We seek unity and we seek reconciliation. So I would encourage you to to go to that person. Maybe an apology is needed. Or maybe it's just, I'm going to try to see things more from your viewpoint. Or maybe it's going, okay, we're just not going to talk about that, but you're important to me, and I want to still be with you. Go to that person if you feel that you need to. Paul goes on, and I recognize these are challenging commands and advice to take, but but he gives them to us for good reason. And so he goes next, not only on our feelings inside, our anger inside, but how we then verbalize ourselves outwardly. Here's what he says. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Paul just keeps making it easier and easier, doesn't he? Oh, wait, no, this this is another challenging command, and yet the church needs it because the church needs to stand out from the rest of the world around us. So Christians must be the ones who only speak if we are seeking to build others up. Can you disagree with someone and they still leave that conversation feeling built up? I hope you can, because that means that you care about the person more than you care about the issue you're talking about. And so again, this isn't suppressing what you believe just to get along. You can disagree, but can they still feel built up in that conversation? I think that happens when we choose grace. When we speak, he says, give words of grace to those you hear. I view that as charitable words, recognizing that I'm not always right and you're not always wrong but let's try to work on this through grace together, whatever that is, that disagreement is in front of you. 
That also means that for some relationships in our life, there may be topics that you just say, these are our forbidden topics. Uh, We are not going to talk about politics. We're not going to talk about that side of the family, right? We're not going to talk about this or this or this. But instead, can you find moments of connection? Can you find things that you agree about and say, I'm going to lean in to that direction? I think what Paul wants for us is not to lean into our differences, but to lean into the things that we do have in common. Can you find that in that relationship that you may be struggling with? And then these are the final commands that he gives in this section. He says, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. I'd like to point out, I never told you that following Jesus would be easy, because it's not. This is going to be the hardest thing that you ever do, but it's worth it, because this is a whole new type of life that God is calling us to. Remember how this chapter began. It's a high calling, the highest calling, And these are the descriptors, the characteristics of a life that is seeking to live into that high calling. So it's not easy, but it is 100% worth it. And one reason why we gather every week on Sunday mornings, it's not only to worship and to pray and to praise together, but it's also to commit with one another to living this sort of life to saying, okay, it doesn't matter how anyone else lives outside these walls, but these are the ideals for us. These are the ideals for those who are seeking to live like Christ wants us to live. And so my hope for you is that you can be people who are kind in a world that is desperate for kindness, that you can be tender-hearted instead of having a hard heart, that you can forgive others, because Christ has forgiven you. Embodying these traits is the only way to move forward as one body of Christ with one spirit and one church. Yes, my prayer for this church in particular is that we can become an example to all the rest of Lincoln County of what a community of people looks like when it says we're okay with differences, but we're embracing unity even in the midst of it by making faith in Jesus at the very center of what we do. So speak truth to one another, but do so in love. Be angry, but don't let your anger lead you to sin. And take care of one another, bearing with one another in love. May we be the church that is committed to one God, who is in all and through all and above all. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.